I mean, it's just, it's, it, it makes me so angry. And it just smacks of corporate lethargy, corporate inability to care. And, you know, I've, I've no doubt if, if I was to have this conversation, I'm, I'm not clever enough to be a corporate CEO. No, I'm certainly not political enough. And I've no doubt I'd be tied up in some kind of corporate language about how I don't understand the facts of business and that's why it was necessary to do this and balance sheet that and balance sheet what and cash flow this and that and future and shareholders blah blah fish paste. It all is garbage. We haven't been paid. We've produced a hell of a lot. And the big thing is that we are an incredibly important voice for conservation and for nature. Uh, and multi-choice has stated that that's an important aim of theirs to be a voice for nature and the environment and I just can't see how on earth they think that their promise to pay us and then reneging on that is anything other than completely unacceptable. Anyway, that's my rant. We'll see you on Wednesday for the next live drive. Until then, good night. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. everybody welcome 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 we are back with another sunrise safari and you're here live with us at Amakala private game reserve in the eastern cape hello hello everybody welcome my name is eric joined by morgan behind the camera and this morning in the dark we are going to be your eyes and ears it is a slightly windy morning here you can see the little branch that we are looking at there is a zersia, actually a little shrub does have a little bit of wind blowing over it so i'll set the scene it's a little chilly definitely warmer than it was yesterday there's a little bit of a drizzle but not nothing too vigorous now you must remember this is a live and interactive show and we do love to hear from you so please by all means, ask questions, <clears throat> excuse me, make some comments, and you can do so by uh, going onto our Wild Earth app where you can register to make comments and ask questions. You can also do so on YouTube in the comment section. And if that doesn't work, you can also go onto Twitter using the hashtag Wild Earth tag to get involved in the conversation. And go ahead and do that. Like I said, we do like to hear your questions and we love your comments. Sure, that's something we don't actually hear all the time is there's a fiery neck nightjar that is calling just to our south. And in a Cape Robin chat. Is it a Cape Robin chat? No, I lie. That's not a Cape Robin chat. It's an olive thrush on the left hand side Anna Marie good morning good morning I will just apologize we are struggling with Duma and the signal they are working on it so as soon as they are up and live they will join the show there's a yellow bull duck hmm. three birds we don't normally hear in the morning fiery neck night jar yellow bull duck and uh, an olive thrush. There's a white eye in there. I don't know what's going on. It's a change of bird scenery today. That's quite nice. Uh, obviously up in Juma, if they join us, I'm sure they will. Uh, I believe on Wendy 
it will be James and BK. Sorry, that will be Rusty. And then on Wendy, it will be Steve and Gert. And then in our office, I believe we have Gwen as our director and MC. I'm not too sure who's director to and tech this morning. You can... Oh, feeling that breeze is starting to get maybe just a little bit stronger. I'm sure it's fine for now. But I'm sure a little bit later it may get a little bit problematic. But still a lovely still morning. Just listening out to any noises of the night. Kelly, indeed, indeed, yes, we are ready to see what Mother Nature is going to throw at us. And see what her children got up to last night. If I'm not mistaken, uh, we had the elephant herd yesterday in the, in the afternoon. That was an amazing, an amazing time with them. And um, they, I believe, started heading east from this area that we're in. Buffalo have also headed east. Uh, at the moment, I think there's just a few loose bulls, if that, around the dune thicket area and this this area here. And then, obviously, we've got our three amigos that are somewhere around. Um, but they're still in that northern, northwestern area of the reserve. Oh, there's the jackals. The jackals are calling now. Just a bit of satellite calling. Wow, that is amazing. So that is obviously two fe uh, male and a female, a monogamous pair. And in the meantime, we're going to send you over to the weather to see what Mother Nature has in store for us today. Well, the weather is telling you a great a foul and contemptible lie. It is not partly cloudy in Juma. It is uh, very cloudy in Juma. A thick bank of cloud. A thick, not think, thick bank of cloud covers the low field. My name is James Henry. Bertus is on camera. There he is. And uh, the two ladies on work experience are still with me until 10 to 8, after which I shall dispatch them for home. I hope that you are all well wherever you happen to be in the world. We have got reports of a male lion that came onto Juma, that's the reserve we're on here in the western parts of the Greater Kruger. But I have yet to see any sign of said kitty cat, but hopefully we'll find him. It's a sort of windy, cool day. I expect there may be some drizzle a little bit later. But we'll see how the day plays out, as we always must when we're on safari. Please do send us your questions, hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. Otherwise, you can use the chat stream on YouTube. Otherwise, you can use our website. Linda, what creatures can we expect after rain? Well, tortoises like to come out after rain. Anything that is a little bit water dependent, like uh, giant land snails. And then normally 
sort of in early summer you'll start to have dung beetles and blooms of insects after rain because they come out of the ground where they've been either hiding or developing and then when the ground softens with the rain they come out but I'm we're quite late in the season for that and it'll, ha it'll have to warm up quite a lot before that happens so normally what happens is the rain comes and nothing much moves and then the Sun comes out and starts to heat everything up and the moisture and the heat result in a great explosion of activity of invertebrate life and in the case of tortoises vertebrate life just one very busy hyena who walked along this road today came through our camp he did she did by the size of her so we'll see these male lions come onto the reserve which would be great otherwise we'll just potter around and see what moved in the night well Charlotte you and me both you say you're on board and hoping for some wild sightings this morning I too am hoping for some wild sightings yesterday evening we had a very quiet time because we were in camp until about an hour before the end of drive rain he's lost comprehensively 2-1 and let's face it the one was a fairly generous point It's always interesting after rain because you have no idea what on earth is going on. Sorry, I believe you lost some picture there. Apologies for that. So as I was about to say, we don't it's very difficult to know what's going on after rain because all the tracks have been washed clean and so it's like a sort of fresh blank newspaper with very headlines on it looking for it's always nice and at the beginning of course will frequently come out and remark their territories so let's hope action Cedric's probably going to fall that one.
Good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our vehicle. Hello, my name is Steve. I'm joined by BK on camera, and we're out and about in a really nice, cool, overcast Juma with the potential of more rain. It rained quite a lot last night. Don't have the numbers for you, but everything got very, very wet, and the road has been washed clean. We've seen a couple of uh, hyena tracks so far, and that is about it. Just going to see if we can cover as much area as we can this morning. Seeing who's been moving around, who's come in. No tracks. After an evening like that, with the wind and the rain, invariably can almost guarantee most of the predators has caught some, something. So if we don't find them today or signs of them today, it could be a few days for the leopards before we... A very very good morning and welcome to the special broadcast. I have got this big lion trying to approach a group of hyenas who are feeding at the moment. I am Sydney of Pumulani Mikosi. I am live from the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park, Sabi Sand. Look at that lion, he's trying to come now. He's running very fast to come and disperse the hyenas at the moment. Look at that. The lion is now, the lion is the lion is trying to fight. He's biting the hyena at the moment. This is so sad. Look at that. The, the lion is catching the hyena. This is so sad. That hyena is badly injured. Look at that. Now the lion is coming back to uh, the, the kill which was eaten by the hyenas. Not too sure. Maybe these hyenas got this kill from the lions. I am not sure what happened here, but that was something else. The lion came running aggressively and started to attack the hyenas right by their territory. We're still sitting here on our perch spot. We've just watched some, a murder of crows. We've actually watched two murders of crows flying away, leaving their perch spots. And uh, as we're sitting here, it is starting to drizzle. So every now and then you may see a cloth in the screen. And that's just Morgan wiping the lens. I'm not too sure. Oh, I don't know. This is a very strange, strange weather we're having for this time of year. And you know, it's supposed to be fairly warmish. Our Laramo, we do, we do have bats here. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we actually have a couple of species of bats. Um, not very big, mostly very small, but they can be uh, a menace sometimes because they do love to nest in the roofs of chalets and cottages um, and it sometimes can be a bit of a noise but um, it can also create an unpleasant smell but yes we do have bats hmm, i've heard a noise i'm not too sure what that animal was have another listen and see maybe it will vocalize again for us uh, I thought it was a an antelope of of some sort uh, barking in the bush and it actually turns out it's a <laughs> a pied crow that's just going whap, whap in the bushes, not too far, or well, on top of a tree somewhere, not too far away from us. Um, but it's actually quite cool. There's uh, a couple of dead trees down here, fairly close to us, and I found that a lot of the pied crows will uh, um, roost on those dead trees for quite some time, you know. Um, 
this is obviously the area where they have felt that this is where they want to sleep. Obviously, this is not always the area where they operate. You may see some, might see some flying in screen. Carol, we have a whole host of antelope. We have most of your general game that you can find on the fields of, well, sorry, the savannas and the open grasslands of South Africa. Um, now, in on the open fields, we have black wildebeest, red hearted beast, earlant, uh, zebra, which is not an antelope, but <laughs> still plains game, uh, blessbok, and then springbok. In the thicket areas, we have impala, kudu, uh, bushbuck, waterbuck, nyala, uh, dacre. I know I'm missing some. But um, yeah, we have most of your general game that you'll find all around South Africa. And that's quite nice. It does provide a bit of a, a, a bit of an option for the lions. They're not constantly having to go for one specific animal. Although they, they tend to, um, they love the warthogs. So every now and then you'll hear them on a carcass and that'll be a warthog carcass um, but on top of that the lions also like the black wildebeest you'll find that if they're very close to a herd of black wildebeest or um, within let's say two kilometers of it of them as we go into the evening then it's not always guaranteed but you can almost bank on the fact that they'll be on a black wildebeest carcass in the morning and um, now they I don't know what it is I think it's because black wildebeest get a little bit silly at night time or they're just not able to to detect predators as easily during the day they're flawless amazing eyesight amazing hearing amazing smell they'll see the lions from a long way but <laughs> when it comes to night time it's almost as if they uh, they struggle a little bit and the uh, lions tend to take them out with ease but that's also because lions their eyesight is incredible at night time oh, right. so now that we're talking about Amakala we're going to send you over to a clip that is about Amakala private game reserve the edge of the Great Karoo, where the semi-desert gives way to the sea-scented Albany thicket, is a feast for the senses. An inspirational conservation story of courage, politics, patience, and success. This land was once grazing for sheep and cattle and plowed for pineapple and shikari. Now it is a burgeoning biodiversity hotspot where indigenous species once again roam the hills and thrive in the soil. Wow. Breakfast has been served. <laughs> Stamping authority. I tell you what, we've caught up with the three amigos and it's about to go down. Look at them moving in slow motion. They are totally focused. Amakala is a natural wonder. Where once they were bleating herds, the wild predators have returned. Where cattle tore up the grasses, indigenous ungulates now thrive. Where the thickets expanded unhindered, elephants have returned to redesign the landscape. Seems everybody's coming to say hello here now. Good afternoon, good afternoon. How does it? 
you well? Lesser known gems of this land, brown hyena and even rare Ardfof. Amakala is a tribute to rejuvenating powers of wilderness and a testament to human endeavor. Now that you've had a little bit of a history lesson here at Amakala, this is actually probably a very nice place <clears throat> to explain a little more. That we are in a what you call a 40 year, 50 year regrowth cycle. And that means obviously after all the cultivation and all the working of the land, it obviously takes a little bit of time for all the natural plants to come back um, and uh, grow naturally as they were. So it takes about 40 years to 50 years to get to what it, what, what it used to be like. And we are, well, we're nearly 25 years, not 26 years through it so we're almost pretty much halfway in a sense um so i'm pretty excited to see what happens within the next few years of amakala and how it comes along in terms of game reserve as well as rewilded area fancy playing safari snaps or showing off your photo skills in fun competitions how about sneak peeks of our brand new camera spots and live chats with fellow AFRICAM fans. Well, AFRICAM All Access has got your back. Just head to AFRICAM's YouTube channel, hit the join button and select AFRICAM All Access. You'll unlock AFRICAM premium website perks and all the VIP benefits of our YouTube memberships. There's a very grumpy, grumpy crow flying by itself. I wonder what the story is there. Um, once again, I'd just like to apologize. We will have, when Juma is up and running again, we will go back to them. They are just struggling with the signal. I think it's, it's the story of our lives at the moment, really. This time of the year, I don't know if it's the rain, if it's the storms that we're having. 
but nothing seems to be on our side. But as I always say, patience and persistence pays off. So we're going to be patient and we're going to be persistent in the hope that we come right. Okay, Morgan's just going to switch out of IR away from the black and white. Oh, look at the color. <clears throat> Terry, um, <clears throat> I'm a color. Put animals on this area for the first time in 90, I think it was, sorry, no, in 2000. It would have been in 2000, but there also would have been other animals already on the land, like kudus, dacre, uh, baboons, monkeys, uh, mongoose, maybe mere, no, I don't think the mere cats were here. Um, but you know, there's, when you have a farm in South Africa, especially where you have beef cows um, that live in the in, in the lands and you have sheep you have such a large area where you don't cultivate the land or you don't cut down the shrubbery you're going to have wild animals living in there uh, porcupines art fog they also would have lived there I don't think brown hyena um, as they may have been a bit of a problem with the livestock but uh, yeah about 23 to 24 years ago they started putting animals on a makala. And then only later did they get the, 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 the our key species animals. So our elephants and our lions and our buffalo and our giraffe. Speaking of giraffe, have a look there. We've got some giraffe in the distance. We've been watching them, but it's been a little bit difficult obviously with the light not on our side it's uh it's not as easy and it is it is still a bit dark i mean we don't have a sunrise this morning very overcast like i said uh, we had a little bit of drizzle earlier but it's nice to see the giraffe are starting to come back into this area again i think they've exhausted their time in the basin and i think they're also moving away from uh, those lions and that's something i've also noticed is the rutting season has been uh, sort of sort of begun um i think the animals that I, i've heard the most is uh, the impala the impala males or the impala rams they really are going and they have the specific rutting core uh, and it actually sounds quite scary you know it, it sounds something like a oh, if you know what a crocodile uh, kind of roar is mixed with a lion and it's little grunts um, and then they they have almost like a, a hiss towards the end of it and it goes on for quite some time you I mean they can be calling for up to three to five minutes um, but uh, yeah, if you didn't know it was an impala you would probably think it was some form of some form of a predator uh, but it's just the impalas grunting at each other but um, I uh, also had the red heart abuse yesterday afternoon going at it as well. We didn't see it, but we heard it. And uh, we heard it. They were knocking each other down. And I said it was sparring. I'm sure it, also, I'm sure it was sparring because it didn't sound very, very loud. You know, it didn't sound like they were getting rather aggressive with each other. But uh, we definitely heard a, a few hard impacts. Mm, and our giraffe, just like that, phew, gone, disappeared behind the bushes. Not really bushes, they disappeared behind the trees. Alex, they really are. They are really really resilient creatures and uh, mentally strong I mean they live 
almost all over South Africa now. Um, I think places where you may struggle to find giraffe is uh, in the Western Cape. I'm not saying there aren't giraffe there. Uh, they're probably just not very many. You'll find a couple of giraffe, uh, you know, sort of not really on the outskirts, but like maybe around the borders of the Western Cape in areas where there is obviously still tall trees for them and non-rocky mountain areas I don't think giraffe would strive or survive very nicely in a very mountainous area unlike the zebras and the mountain zebra they live there with ease and I think it's also because they have slightly smaller bodies and um, smaller hooves which uh, enable them to move over the rocks which, with ease and I've seen them do it before they jump on those rocks like mountain goats. Sure. The crows are very vocal in this area. But it's not even like there's carcasses here. Because there's no predators. Oh, Anna Marie. I also hope so too. Those three amigos are, from what I understand, are in a very tight, tight area. And uh, an area where we try to go and explore and try to find them. But because there's so much shrubbery there, and they tend to go to the very, very bottom of those little valleys, it can be difficult. But uh, I don't think they're going to be there for much longer. They definitely... Uh, <laughs> they're definitely trapped in that side for now uh, until the the rain cease, ceases uh, the tunnel that is the linking uh, kind of point to get from the main reserve into that area is sort of flooded and <laughs> I don't think those uh, cats are going to want to drag their paws through that water and it's not shallow uh, I would say it's in some places it's pretty deep like it could be ankle depth for some of us I'm not too sure if you can hear that but there's a <laughs> impala grunting down below us unhappy No, that is something you don't want to hear at night time. Like I said, if you don't know what it is, <laughs> it can be actually quite terrifying. All right. We're going to link you over to the Nkukui waterhole to enjoy the lovely sounds that it has. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content.
So we've moved to this little pan. We're just going to sit here and listen because the birds here are amazing. And I'll give a little description of who we've heard and who's in the area afterwards. Catherine indeed had the bath, not the bath, sorry, not a bath, right, the polis. Yeah, it is a bath, right, the polis, sorry, ma, it is, that's right, I'm thinking of the Cape Batters. Yeah, so we had the bath, right, the polis behind us. That's another bird I was trying to figure out, I'm struggling to... Kind of, the name is evading me. I know the bird, but the name is definitely evading me. I think, uh, greenback Camaroptera. That was pretty cool. I can still hear the olive thrush. Which is quite nice. Like I said, we don't always get to hear the olive thrush. And uh, I think it's because of the weather that we've been having. It's nice and wet, and uh, they love, love the worms. The worms and the insect that love the wet soil. And naturally, all of them are coming out now, with lots of mud being around. There's also going to be lots of insects that got caught flying around in the rain and in the elements, and they are either struggling to we get a fly again on the floor or they are actually have died uh, due to the rain and these birds are capitalizing on this feeding opportunity. It's still quite dark here. Yeah, uh, Lexi, they will. They will come to the water hole. I mean, the animals need to drink water the same amount as we need to drink water. You know, some animals are just more dependent on it than others. Um, you know, animals like elephants, quite dependent on water. Not all elephants. Some elephants, I find you'll find that our elephants are quite dependent on water, um, as well as other varieties of antelopes. So yeah, there'll definitely be animals coming to have a sip of water. They might not come now; they'll still be here. They just sometimes may not drink as much, you know. Because obviously with the heat, you sweat, you lose fluids, you've got to now kind of fill your body back up with the fluids. And the weather like this, mm, you don't really sweat. So there's no real need to drink too much. this water. I'm very, very happy that there's a bit of water in here. This is where we had the elephant herd come down from the opposite side that we are sitting at. Um, they came down to the waterhole. 
It looked bone dry. One of them decided it's going to walk across the waterhole and then started sinking into the mud, at which point the majority of the herd decided it's a mud bath time and they all kind of started, you know, congregating in the center of this pan and uh, started throwing mud around each other and they were rolling in it. Oh, it's okay. Uh, they were rolling in the mud and they were having an absolute time here. And uh, I thought they were going to get a bit grumpy. Tyler, hmm, that's a good question. I've got to <laughs> actually think about that one. Um, it definitely is one of two occasions or two occasions that I've been relatively uh, shook. I think one of them was in the presence of Koli. Now, I went down into a river crossing where you can't actually see what's in the crossing itself. Um, you kind of have to go in and find out. And um, I'd gone in and nobody had come to this river crossing, so nobody knew that there was an elephant there. I didn't know there was an elephant there. Went in there. Uh, and there's Collie all by himself feeding and there's probably about 15, tw you know, 15 20 meters in, among, in between us and uh, I don't know if he was in must or what the story was but he turned around and he came at us very quickly he probably stopped at about 5 meters but I was reversing like <laughs> crazy to try and get out of there and then uh, I think uh, yeah, the one that takes the cake was nearly being taken out by a lion trying to change a tire. And it's always when you're trying to change tires that animals come and mess with you. Um, that's happened twice before, but uh, the last time there was maybe a little bit more interest in me. Uh, and uh, oh, those lions got pretty, pretty close um, before I uh, managed to get away or get into the car at least. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that was probably definitely the scared, the most, yeah, definitely the scaredest I've ever been out here. And uh, Kali is a big guy. When I mean, that guy is running at you, and you can see he's running at you, your heart is in your throat, blocking your airway, so you can't breathe but uh, we are good friends now, I think. <laughs> Every time I've been in his presence since, he's, he's been uh, uh, <laughs> a lovely, a lovely guy. I'm wondering, I think Bellara is starting to take over his behavior. Because every time we've been around him, he's just been so pushy and so kind of in our faces, kind of where e everyone else is just kind of, you know, minding their own business and Bolari, he comes straight to the car. But he is young, he is inquisitive. It happens with elephants. We're going to send you to watch a clip that uh, talks about elephants all over and their behavior. Elephants have fascinated us for so long because they display the same social complexities and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, cousins and aunts live in herds while the bulls wander the wilderness as bachelors. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the end of their life some 60 years later. The herd is led by the oldest and wisest female, the matriarch. She's not only responsible for leading the herd, but also dishing our discipline to the often unruly teenagers.
With their flappy ears, floppy trunks, and folded skin, baby elephants have the cuteness edge over their human counterparts. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious, and love rolling about in the dirt. Human voices and vehicles provide endless entertainment for bored little elephants, and they, in turn, are always a source of amusement for us. Exploring is the main source of calf entertainment, but it's a scary and sometimes prickly world out there. And mum is thankfully never far off. Bulls become boisterous when they hit puberty, and this irritates the matriarch. Once she's had enough, she will boot them out of the herd to find their own way in the world. Like playground bullies, the young males fight for dominance, sometimes with extreme violence. The older bulls live alone but mentor these young bucks. It is these fellows that are the ultimate gentlemen of the wilderness. Uh, there's some information to take in, but uh, man, yeah, indeed, female elephants do stay, <coughs> excuse me, in the herd for majority of their lives, and the bulls get pushed out when they start causing nonsense, and that's generally at the age, uh, well, it varies, you know, some some bulls get. They weren't really kicked out at the age of 10. You're still very young there. But uh, from the ages 15 and onwards, I suppose, generally that's when uh, they start causing a bit of trouble. So elephants in the ages like uh, Booty and Ballara, they're going to start being told, well, they've already been told, um, Ananzi and Kola, I think, are next. They probably got another two years in the in the herd, and then they're going to, Letitia and Baduleka and Cooper are probably going to start saying to them, listen, uh, it's been nice having you, but uh, you guys can go off on your own now. It's time to find your wings, fly, and leave the nest. And uh, when you go to areas where there are lots of elephants, you will see this. You'll find bulls by themselves, uh, sometimes even together in small groups, or and uh, you'll find the females. You know, it's not very, it's not very unheard of to find just females and some young. All right, we are going to send you over to James. To have a look at what he's got. Right, well, sorry for the delay and the technical glitches, but here we have got a pack of wild hounds, and we found them about half an hour ago now, I think, 20 minutes ago. And we've been following them ever since. We've got Vorv here as well, so between the two of us we'll hopefully be able to stay with the pack. They've been on the road for the majority of the time we've been with them, but they're now heading off into a block so thick that it would be difficult to navigate it with a bulldozer. Um, but we will try. We will try. What do you reckon? Where are you going to head? All right, I'll go straight. I'll go straight in after them. Do you want to go round? Oh no, we're back on the road. Never mind. Let's carry on. I think they're after something. It's always nice when we've got two vehicles in a dog sighting because it means that we can 
have a better chance of staying with them. This one in front of us is having a hell of a morning. It's definitely got some issue with its tum, trying desperately to go to the loo, failing dismally. How many stations on Juma this morning? Morning, Pete. There were a couple that have left. Sorry, Grumpy. on safari. Oh, hello. Smelling each other, smelling other things. Unfamiliar smells or perhaps fresh smells after the rain. Lovely chorus of black-headed orioles in the background. Sorry, I'm just going to have to get on the radio. Last station, go again. Yeah, there's a pack of wild dogs mobile in a southwesterly direction on Vultures Nest Road. Uh, two stations here, one responding. Negative, just Pete from Ankoro making his way here. Yeah, make your way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, a little injury. So we are still live, everybody. <laughs> Peter, I'm afraid I missed your comment. Um, I'm just going to go around into the riverbed here. Oh, 
Hold on tight. Oh, is it easier to hunt after the rain, Peter? No, I don't think so. I think it's about the same for them. I don't think it makes any difference. <laughs> Poo! Yay! Best ever chew toy. The lion cubs do lose their little milk teeth like other animals and it's something that we've seen more with leopard cubs than we have with lion cubs. We haven't really focused in on the, the process of their teeth and the way that they grow but it happens sort of around about I'm guessing with lion cubs around about six to eight months maybe eight months would be more realistic where they start to grow their permanent teeth and the their little milk teeth pop out and that is elephant dung and elephant dung is fun I'm bored with tails now elephant dung is the next thing Wow Yes, does that taste nice? Yeah, blah, 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 flim. Sorry about that, everybody. We sometimes have difficulty broadcasting from these wild locations live. Wild dogs, wild dogs, wild dogs. They have Kralwati. James followed them into the river there. And uh, they're going to come out around Chilapan. High octane safaris this morning. Not really, not really high octane. Obviously the radio is going absolutely crazy now. Okay, see if we can find them. They would have come out just up here by Chilla. Anna Marie, well, we noticed the female look very pregnant. Well, I don't know very, but pregnant. Yeah, I don't know why. You can take it from my shoe then. Yeah, you can take it from my shoe. Okay. Um, as long as I'm done, I'll wait for Peter. Oh, do you want to They're going down, Biggs. Are they at Chalapan? Are they on the... Is he pointing? Okay. James is with them. Gonna go back to... They're milling around. They're milling. They're... Sounds like James has got them. He's just over there. We're gonna send you back over to him. Right, here we go. We've got them again. Sorry you lost us. It was because we went down into the riverbed. But we've come up the other side. And here are the hounds. They look, I must say, it's quite interesting. They're not all in the same condition. This chap right next to us is kind of hippie. Doesn't look particularly well-muscled or well-fed. Whereas the other one there next to us is. Maybe just an older dog. All right, let's go backwards. Hold on tight. Unfortunately, Steve and I are not going to be able to double team this sighting for much longer because lots of people are coming towards it. But that's okay. One of us will stay. There we go. In front of us.
Well, yes, Elian, here we go on a wild dog ride. This certainly is a wild dog ride. Whew, maybe they'll settle here. That would be nice. shutter speed up now. Now Shreyas says we have the Mbali pack. I have no reason to doubt Shreyas <laughs> ever. Right let me just go forward. Animals now at Chelapan, static at the junction, Pangolin Track and Twin Dams. Fresh wild dog tracks on the road there. static at the junction looking like they're going to go down south down Twin Dams. Wild, uh, wild at heart you want to know what the biggest pack I've ever seen is it's the biggest pack I've seen I think 24. This is um, El Constipato in front of us here having a bit of a drink of water but you can see the tail cocked up and clearly unable to relieve herself now putting her bottom into the water for some soothing. Maybe she got hold of Marcel's incredibly vicious chili sauce last night and that's caused the problem. Because I've never seen a wild dog place its bottom into the water for soothing purposes until today. You learn something new every day. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Oh dear, the channel is busy. Why is the channel busy? It's going to be very difficult to tell people where we're going. Let me just help it out a bit. That didn't work. Right. We're now heading in a southwesterly direction. Stations, these animals are now heading southwest through the block between from the junction Pangolin Track Twin Dams. Sorry, Barbara. Every time I get a comment or a question, I get onto the radio and it's, my timing is very poor. I'm going to ask your question again, please, Gwen Nyai. Sorry about that. Yes. The dog's colours against the fresh green bush are beautiful. These are the original camouflage fatigues. So, I mean, this is really the original camo. Basically, every army in the world has a poor, a poor copy of the wild dog's camo. Right, we've got them all around us here, some in the bush, some running through the bush, some running around and through the bush. 
I'm tempted to head to the clearings to the left of us, but I suspect that they are going to go the opposite direction. Uh, Pete, I think your best bet at the moment is to come. Shoo, uh, they're in that block now. I think your best bet's going to be to come down Pangolin Track and try and come into the block uh, from the junction. Alternatively, take a chance and go Elephant Carcass. So go Weaver's Nest, Elephant Carcass. Cedric's probably going to fall that one. There, they've caught something. They've got something in there. There we go. It might just be a bit of bush. No, they've missed it. They chased something in there. I'm not sure what it was. Pete, just turn off there. You'll hear me. I do apologize for the radio. I'm just trying to help somebody get into the sighting. We're quite far into the block to the west of you. Okay, we're gonna, apparently our signal's not great. We're gonna link over to Amakala while we carry on trying to follow these dogs. I think I had your audio, James. Yo. Peter, I, I think her on. We've found some red heart beast. You can see a glossy starling. Sorry, not a glossy starling, a cape starling has just landed next to them. But 
sitting on a very naked branch there is a black-headed heron. I, I adore black-headed herons. They are cool birds. Only because, you know, they eat anything and everything that can fit into their mouths. Be it a mouse, be it a fish, be it a small bird, maybe even a small snake. They're not picky at all. They're actually opportunistic hunters. So, uh, you know, they won't hesitate at all. And uh, we mostly find them along the river, the river systems and, and along dams and pans where they mostly feed on aquatic life. So frogs, tadpoles, fish, crabs, um, but uh, you, they, they have also known to be seen in uh, open fields where they feed on pretty much anything they can get their beaks on, which would also, this would be crickets, grasshoppers, beetles, um, all sorts of grubs, caterpillars, centipedes, millipedes. Oh, he's flown off now. And uh, they've just moved to perches, really. You also see them walking around big herded animals um, and when they're around big herded animals they're usually walking at the back of them, them and the, the little egret you'll find uh, and that's mostly just because of the disturbances that the big animals make. Um, there's all sorts of food opportunities there where they can grab something that was pushed away from a bush by a hoof. Um, or disturbed by a mouth that's grabbing grass. Same reason you'll find the cape starlings, the drongos, the um, the pearl-breasted swallows. Like I said, the little egret, the eastern cattle egrets. Um, you know, you'll find yeah a fair, fair amount of birds in and around herded animals. I mostly actually started seeing it with cows, uh, and that would have been the eastern cattle egrets. Cattle egrets love cows, and obviously we call them cattle egrets for a reason. <laughs> and uh, it's a little white egret with a orangey kind of, <laughs> orangey peachy kind of coloured feathers. Not all over its throat, just a little bit of them. I think it's on the throat or the back of the head. It's one of the two, but not both. Um, and uh, oh, you find them all around the, the domestic cows, but also buffalo. Lolo, no, no, they, they're not the only ones. The forktail drongo can be seen feeding off uh, animals on ticks and all sorts. They're not shy at all. And uh, quite often, I've seen it before, I've seen forktail drongos actually chasing away uh, uh, red-billed oxpeggers uh, from animals. Um, the animal that actually was, they were chasing them away from was actually a rhino. Um, I don't know what the drongo was wanting there, but um, no, he didn't want any of those oxpeggers around. This is my rhino. These are my ticks to eat, my parasites. You can find another animal to go and eat your parasites on. And drongos, I've said it before and I'll say it again. They're not birds you want to mess with. They don't play games, especially when it comes to nesting. You come into their nesting ground where you walk underneath the tree where they're nesting and uh, you've got these dive bombers coming out of the tree right at you and I mean they they probably pull away from your face just before your face like <laughs> a good few centimeters it's actually quite scary so you tend to move out of the area pretty quickly they also get very very aggressive with other birds and uh, usually when you see a bird of prey being mobbed by something it's either a starling 
most of the time, a fork-tailed drongo, uh, and then there's a couple of other small birds that will also mob them, but it's mostly starlings and fork-tailed drongos that mob big birds of prey, uh, be it out here in the wild or sometimes even in town. Um, I've seen it in towns before, all oh, the drongos. I think a drongo has the same sort of personality that a Jack Russell has, where he thinks that it's bigger than it actually really is. And uh, <laughs> they still cause the same amount of havoc. havoc. Oh, Red Hot Tipias are not playing ball with us here. They're all over the place. And it's fine, it's fine, because sometimes we come down here and we don't see any of them. Mandy, good question. The largest antelope species we have here would be the eland, or the eland, as some people call them. That is the largest antelope in the world. There is no antelope bigger than that. And, uh, no. Oh. They can get up to quite some some weights. Um, you know, females averaging between 650 kgs all the way up to about 800, 850 kgs, where males will average probably about 750. This is obviously now at uh, 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 going from sub-adult to fully grown adult. Um, <laughs> not juveniles, those are very, very heavy juveniles, good grief. Uh, but uh, yeah, males were average from about 750 all the way up to just short of a ton. And sometimes you can actually get some bulls that will be over a ton. Um, and those are big, big earlines. Um They will have these fat, thick, thick necks full of muscle. And that's to fight with. Uh, do what those red heart beasts were about to do. And I don't know, they decided they weren't going to do it. Um, but, uh, well, Ireland is definitely large, large animals. And they stand about uh, a meter and a half to two meters tall. Now, the bird life today is going off. Everybody seems happy. Even though it's a slightly chilly chillier morning and I said it's, it started off it started off quite nice it was pretty average temperature for the morning and now I don't know what's happened it's just got chilly like this breeze oh my goodness <laughs> it's cold There's a little familiar chat somewhere. I can just hear him. Wait. Somewhere. There's the Sombe green bull. The darker boo boo. have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content.
the different calls you have like a, a part, uh, the Cape Crow does more of like a, a shriek a shriek and a shout where as a Pied Crow is more of like a I don't even know how to how, 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 how to describe the sound but it's more like a it sounds very funny it's obviously nothing what I just made I tried my very best to imitate there but it didn't sound anything like it but um, you know they kind of have like a I want to say it's a gobble but it's not really a gobble we didn't know turkey's gobble got the bok makiri behind us sure it always fascinates me how they work together so well to create such a beautiful call A true testament to each other's love. Obviously being monogamous birds. Welcome back. Just shopping out with James for his uh, wild oak sighting. Because uh, He's got some uh, technical issues, so we're going to go take over, spend some time with the dogs who seem like they've slowed down. Cover that jams, I should be there in a minute. Okay, so we should have dogs in 15 seconds. 14 seconds. Uh, uh, yeah, copy that. Has, has been raining, so a little bit of moisture on the lens is common plates. Are we ready for some dogs? Are we ready for some dogs? I'm ready. I mean, we've already spent a bit of time with them. But, well, why not a little bit more time? Peter's excited. Last nice one, Pete. I'm glad you could get there. Enjoy your morning. It's nice to work as a team, everybody, and to get other people into wild dog sightings and things like that you know because sometimes you know that is one of the benefits you've got a one hyena here it's one of the benefits of uh, of having the radio you see is the ability to communicate and facilitate sightings now we've we were with James for a while there was no one else on the property so we were able to enjoy bumbling along with James at the same time um, and then we moved out and then you just listen listen to the movement and to all of the things and then you can come and go now we're approaching an old hyena den or at least a termite mound that if you recall a while ago I had Tingana making a kill of a warthog Alex, wild dog sightings are always brilliant, aren't they? Always brilliant. It's been quite relaxed for us. Now that individual there is going to go chase that hyena. Watch out, Beaks. You're about to get a bum in your shot there. Oh no, you're not. It's one of the other vehicles is turning around with his Land Cruiser. A little bit of a boat. You do need a skipper's license to drive these Land Cruisers. Not the same as with us and our little short wheel base. Here we go, BK, right here is coming one. Oh, they're going back west again, east again. 
Morning, morning. Sounds like they caught something over there. My earpiece is full of night, Gwen. Sorry, I'm not ignoring you. I don't think they caught anything. Huh? They were chasing the hyena. Yes, you were, because he's a naughty. It was a naughty hyena, isn't it? Naughty hyena. Which pack are you? We saw them earlier and they got lots. Let me just move up a little bit more, Beaks. Got lots and lots of ear markings. This clan, this pack. Lots of little ear markings. Oh, sorry about the pole. Nicole, are hyena the only predators that follow wild dogs? Properly, yes. I mean, a lion will follow them to eat them and leopard will follow them to eat them, but they don't follow them to pick up on the scraps. That's for sure. Let me take off my hoodie. It was raining before. I'm going to reposition in a moment. Sorry. About the quick wash. They, I don't know what they're doing. They're giving this wild dog, this uh, hyena, a hard time. That's what they're doing. They're bored. Let me move out of the way. They are bored. Really nice group. How many did we count, Beaks? There's at least more than eight, eh? Yep. I never actually got a proper count of them. Mbali pack, thank you very much. Okay, let me move down, Beak, so we're going to get in front of them there. Sounds like my CV joint is on its way out. Sorry, Beaks. Did I get you? It was a magic worry, though, so it wasn't too bad, eh? It's an impressive group of dogs here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, probably ten or eleven, I'm not sure. A couple of them behind the bush there. This one with the collar has got a short tail. Not stubby, but shorter. <laughs> Lately, Anna Marie, there's been great interaction between them, hasn't there? Very busy. Well, they're not busy like dogs normally are, but they're very alert. And, uh, you know, the winter time is coming. Another two months or so, we'd expect them to be denning. But, um, one of them did look, I don't actually remember seeing, but BK was quite certain one of them looked quite pregnant. I don't know if you noticed the, the teats beaks on that one, or is it just a full belly? You did, eh? Yep. Okay. And it's not impossible for them to be looking for a den. Not impossible. Would you den on Juma, doggies? Maybe. I like that discussion of James talking about how the, the camouflage of 
most military outfits has been mimicked from the wild dog. Definitely, definitely. Beautiful tri-coloration. I know James was super happy to have found them this morning. To show his guests they are leaving this morning. So, wild dogs for the win on a wet morning like this. What did James say about when the animals come out? What animals come out on days like this? Well, I can tell you, the whole northern Sabi Sands is interested in connecting with us on the radio. They all want to be here. Okay, well, we're going to try to get you a better view of these dogs. And let's send you on down to Amakala with Eric and Samaranis. Wow, wow, we look at what we've stumbled across here. Beautiful, beautiful white rhino female, and she is covered, covered in mud. She's had a good, good mud bath somewhere, not too sure where. But wow, amazing. And she's not alone. She's got a little baby with her, and you may just be able to only just see the little baby sort of in front of her right back leg. Here's a little gray thing. It was suckling earlier. I can't see if it's suckling now. But I'm sure this little baby is going to be on its feet in no time. This is really, really cool. I think this baby is actually just taking a little bit of a, uh, a breather or rester. When we arrived in the area, it was obviously sitting up. Oh, here we go. Now that mom's doing a little bit of movement. Her baby may actually stand up a little bit. You can see just a little bit of the ears moving around there. But this is typical rhino baby behavior. While mom feeds, I'll just lie here and catch a few winks. Can be quite tiring being a baby rhino. All this walking around, chasing off the warthogs, and that it happens. <laughs> I've seen baby rhinos chasing warthogs. It's all very tiring. Oh, Jackie, this is indeed. This is amazing. Hmm. We've been talking about the fork-tailed drongos. I've just seen two that, are landing, that have landed in the same area as our rhinos. There's a third one that's just arrived and the baby is still sleeping. Well, not quite. I can see it's just relaxing. His ears are still moving around. There you go. A bit of movement. Yep, yep. Listening to me. Knows mom is close by, so hasn't felt the need to get up and move yet. Um, but I imagine it, it might come pretty soon. I don't want to be left behind now, do we? Mom would never. How could she? She could never leave us, leave her baby behind. And in saying that, she was feeding and walking away, and now she's feeding back towards her baby.
on safari. Live just in time for the wild dog walk by. with the mammary glands visible got a rather large belly I don't know if that means she's pregnant because most of them have got a similar size belly here she comes she does look rather paunchy <laughs> she looks rather paunchy it's a chari position Okay, don't die on me now, eh? Okay. You sure? Yeah. yeah, so she's right here. And I mean, I, I'm no expert at pregnancy, but when I look at a couple of the others, they've also got a, a relatively similar belly. She's just the one with the, the mammary glands that are suckled, mammary, that are obvious. But I think they're all just a little bit, they've all eaten. And yet, yet they're still, quite busy moving slowly slowly inextricably in a southerly direction so some small animal is going to eventually run from them and then they'll catch it and they're capitalizing on the cool temperatures 100% Kim they use termite mounds for denning that's a, a very instrumental part of their habitat, termite mounds. They're able to dig them out with their, with their claws. once more. Okay, this one vehicle just going to bypass us here quickly. It's 
nice to be able to have a wild dog sighting to be able to get so many different people in it took quite a while for um, the first two vehicles from the east and west to join James and now a few have come and gone and we are still here Yeah, an elephant. Elephant herd just through there. We know that they like to chase the dog sometimes. I could just see one there, you see one over there. vehicles. Now let me move up a little bit, Beaks. <laughs> Brandon, they do. They do always bring in some bit of action. We've had a really good time with them. You heard that elephant over my vehicle noise. Okay, so there's a few in the road. There's a few scattered through the thickets here. They're gonna obviously veer away from the elephant. They don't really feel too concerned with the Ellies. They know that they can get away from them quite easily. Elephants, although quite quick compared to us, they really no concern against wild dogs. Obviously, if they caught a wild dog, it would be a different story, but dogs aren't, won't be caught like that. Slowly, slowly, slowly moving south. Just talk to Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, you can make your way. We're on Weaver's Nest, probably 100 meters, 200 meters. No, 100 meters from Gary Main right now, so they are going to cross shortly. Okay, and slowly they go south, and uh, slowly we shall reposition ourselves. BK, spend another moment with them. Oh, oh, we'll just turn. We'll just do absolutely nothing. I'll stay right where I am. Sorry about the fact that these animals are going behind the car. It's okay, Mama. See, now this is all displacement. It's all displacement because of the wild dogs. So in a situation like that, if I did something, if I started my car, if I made noise, if I guar, then she might get aggressive towards me. But it's because she's got babies, because there's predators, and she's she's not happy. Okay, so that displacement behavior right there, Peaks, have a look at her. That displacement there, the female's doing this. Just don't get involved. Rather don't become a form or direction for her to outlet her frustration. Okay, so I nearly started the car there, nearly repositioned, and then I saw her behavior and immediately I just know that if I do something, it's going to cause her to, all that pent up stuff that's coming up for her, she's gonna displace it onto us. Sit still, sit quietly, and allow them to move past. She's just, disconnected from the rest of the herd. Now she's back with them, she'll start to relax. She wasn't a very old girl.
and uh, she knows she's got babies to defend. Predators on the wind. It's suddenly got a bit windier. Action, action, Jive Bunny. So, everyone, I hope you just understand what I mean there. That I saw her coming behind us. She was already in a bit of a space of uncertainty. If I start my engine and make this go, 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 loud, petrol, smoky noise, there's a very good chance she's going to react negatively to that. But if I just sit quietly and I allow her to realize what's going on, allow her to realize that it's not us that's causing her distress then she'll make a decision based on her own self-esteem and self-confidence. I was once in a sighting whereby I followed lions in, I followed a young male in to a kill down a hill. Yes, I said that. And uh, six lions had caught in a pile and wrapped it around a small tree and were feeding on it. I drove down, it was quite a steep slope, pulled up in front of the lions, was looking at them quite nicely. And in that moment, I realized there was a herd of elephant 10, 15 meters to my left hand side. There was nothing I could do. I was down a slope. For me to have started my engine again and reversed out would have required a bit of effort, would have required noise, would have made all sorts of disturbance. I switched off. My tracker was almost shouting at me going, fam bum for, fam bum for, which means go, go, let's go. And I just said, shh, calm down. And the elephants, all of their attention actually was on the lions doing what the lions were doing. It was the noise of the lions, it was the predators, it was the smell, it was the death. That's what got the elephants annoyed. But if I'd started the car, I would have become another noise, another element for her to displace her attention towards. And uh, essentially, I switched off, stayed there, did nothing. The elephants ran over the Prada lion, scattered them in every direction. And that was the end of our engagement in that sighting. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Obviously, if you're driving along the road and an elephant comes towards you like she did, then keep driving. Keep driving. Don't stop your car and say, Steve said I should switch my car off now and I should not do anything. If she's clearly reacting to you because you're driving past, then keep driving your car along. Don't speed so you end up hitting something, but just keep moving. Don't stop and figure out what's going on with this elephant. Rather, just leave. But if you're stopped somewhere and there's definitely predators in the area and those animals come out of nowhere and are reacting to that predatory stuff, they're not reacting to you because you haven't made any noise. You haven't really created a disturbance. So by creating that disturbance, you are then going to attract their attention. Okay, please do let me know if you have any questions about that. They're gone. Okay. Well, that was special. So the dogs are heading towards the boundary. There's quite a few vehicles interested in them. So we're not going to carry on there. Otherwise, we're just going to end up getting stuck on a busy road with lots of vehicles. So we're going to move on. We're going to go check out Treehouse Dam. In two magical African wilderness areas, the Masai Mara in Kenya, the Great Kugu National Park in South Africa, five expert safari guides follow a cast of compelling animal characters and the never-ending stories that define their lives. The CAT report documents real stories of real predators, as witnessed and captured by a band of obsessive wildlife filmmakers. <laughs>
Welcome back live, everybody, where we've got a spotted hyena. Now, this hyena has been following the dogs for some time. They gave it a very hard time a little while ago, and he's decided, or she's decided, I've had enough of these dogs. I'm going to go back and hang out with some of my own friends. You're going to come join us for a coffee at tree, I stand, Mr. or Mrs. Hyena. Maybe. Let's go catch up with it. Maybe we'll get a better idea of it. I can't tell you who that is from here. Primrose, I just hope it's understood what I've said. You know, I think it's so important for people to understand what's going on with elephants if you want to be driving in an area on self-drive. If you're going somewhere and you're with a guide who knows what's going on, okay, that's cool. But if you want to go to the Pilansberg, you want to go to Kenya, Masai Mara, do self-drive, or you want to go to a place like the Kruger, I've been imparting quite a bit of elephant info lately. I think it's so important to actually really understand it. And I don't want to ever hear back like, oh, but Steve said, if you're not quite understanding what it is that I said, I just want to make sure. So. If I'm driving along like this and elephants come out of the bush and they are behaving in a certain way, I'm gonna keep driving. I'm just gonna keep driving, especially at night because you can't see what's going on. But if you drive through a herd and they are just feeding and they're doing all those relaxed signs, switch off the car and enjoy. That is key. Biggs, we're gonna get him. But if you find yourself sitting in a predator sighting and elephants come out of nowhere and start reacting to the predator, it's best to do absolutely nothing. Sorry, Gwen, the comms broke up quite badly there. I think Peter asked a question. If it's passing the car, should you scream? I don't think screaming is ever necessary. Oh, Peter, I think you need to check. You need to check what's going on. If there are elephant tusks in your car, how did you find yourself in that situation, first of all? Uh, an elephant doesn't just walk up to a car and stick its tusks in. What can often be the case is if you're not respecting an elephant's space and they're in the road in front of you and you insist on going past that elephant and you want to push it and push it and push it then, that elephant very likely, nine times out of ten, will move out of the way or run away. But that one time it says, no, I'm not going anywhere, yes, it'll put its tusks through your car and it'll damage it. That is respect. 100% respect. If I've got an elephant in the road in front of me and I need to get somewhere, I either wait or I go another direction. You don't ever try and push an animal out of the way. Ever. It is not what we do from an ethical point of view. I know there was that video on WhatsApp going around. I think James spoke about it with that guy getting the car lifted up by the elephant. Notice the elephant was standing in front of him in the road. He was shouting at it, trying to move it out the way. Complete disrespect. And he learned a lesson. Thankfully, it appears nobody got injured in that. But you don't respect an elephant, it'll hurt you. Give it space, respect it. If it's showing a negative behavior from a distance, move away. If you're not certain about the behavior that it's showing you from a distance, but it feels like it's a bit negative, move away. But if it's walking up to you casually, slowly, with no negative behavior, the chances of it wanting to put its tusks through your car are very little, unless you've blocked the only pathway that there might be through maybe a thicket. Um, there's only one little place it can move through and you've parked there. Move out of the way. That's a respect thing. Those are my thoughts. Anyway, you still got it, BK. <laughs> it's called the tracking shot, everybody.
Okay, well, it's wonderful spending time with predators, especially when elephants join the fray. So, small herd of elephants sneaking up and around and got all the lion's attention. They just hear the branches and the, the noise of something moving in the grass and they all pop their heads up, the opportunists that they are, and uh, they're looking off to the right. This lioness is going, oh, no, we don't go for those, although there are a couple of little ones. Mama is definitely going to be quite something <laughs> to deal with. And uh, this could be entertaining, actually. I don't think the elephants right now know that the lions are here. The lions can't help themselves, though, sometimes when something's moving. They have to chase it. And if it's a young elephant, there's nothing stopping them from investigating the potential of hunting a young elephant. But it's when mum steps forward and reminds them of their place. Up until that point, curiosity <laughs> is enough to encourage the lions to at least move around, especially the youngsters. The adults will probably know better sub-adults intrigued the interest is peaked long well that was wonderful Monday morning you can I spent with the Nkuhuma Talamati group and they'll hear elephants and they'll be like oh, what's that uh, no thanks but it's not impossible for the youngsters to be interested. They'll learn very quickly though, that it's uh, pretty much hands off prey, an elephant. Although in some parts of Africa where the elephants have become the dominant prey animal because just of the landscape, what they've done, the lion prides get up to 30, 40, 50 strong. That is quite frightening. Pride of lion hunting an elephant. It's not something I've ever witnessed in the real life. I've saw the documentary Planet Earth, I think it was, and ooh, it shows behind the scenes of those guys filming in the dark of elephants being chased by lion. Can you imagine? No, thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Oh, hello. Okay, well, we had an impala there. There was a uh, very skittish. He's gone. We're going to see if we can catch up with this hyena where it's gotten to, but it sounds like Eric and Morgan have found themselves a place at a watering hole. We've moved on and we found ourselves at a little water hole here. And this is another water hole and here there's actually appears to be two there's another water hole sort of past this big one you can't really see it um, but it is center screen just to the right of that bush but you know, not much of it can be seen but a little stream of water that once came down to this little well, came down to the bigger pan. Um, 
can see elephants were probably inside there. Elephants or rhinos or buffalo, or something big, maybe, uh, inside that uh, little pan. And that's why it overflowed a little bit. And there's some... A lot of mud. Just lodged mud in this area. An awful lot of footprints. I suspect our elephants took a turn past here on their way east yesterday afternoon. There's a lot of mess here, lots of footprints. Yeah, I think they also did a bit of uh, dust bathing here as well. I don't know if they did any drinking though. Now, you can see these are not so nice looking. Morris, I think the busiest water holes would be the water holes in front of the lodges. If it's not, then it would have to be, uh, I think, Leuvenbosch, yeah, Leuvenbosch Pan. And that's basically just because it's in the middle of a big field um, and uh, a lot of planes game on that field. There's another one called Flucky's Flay Pan and Enjovel Pan. Those are both in the basin. Uh, and those are also relatively busy pans as they do hold water for the longest. Um, yeah, this is a pan that gets visited occasionally by elephants. Uh, it's more for like the kudu, the water bark, the bush bark, the dacre. You know, it's more for your thicket animals. Um, I mean, when we arrived at this water hole, the jackal took off. I don't know if the jackal was staking this water hole out or not the story. The lions will come past you. Um, a lone bull. Mm. There's definitely a very strong smell of elephant here, but I think that comes from the from the droppings on the other side of the pond. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content.
Welcome back live to Juma and Cat Day is officially off to a start. We just missed them drinking, unfortunately, but you can't have it all. I'm assuming this is part of the Nkuhuma Pride. I haven't really had much of an identification feature to know for certain, but just area and size condition. Position shortly and get another view. I'd kind of anticipated them walking a little bit. <laughs> Israel, how close can you get to lions on foot? Well, it depends on the lions. And it depends on how many times they've been walked in their life. But, you know, where that lioness is there, that one that BK's got in frame, that's about as close as you get to lion on foot before you know about it. Uh, Sometimes you can be sleeping, you can get a little bit closer than that. But they generally move away or let you know that they're there. So that look that she's giving, you'll be seeing just that head pop up above the grass. And uh, you might see it before you hear it. Sometimes you don't see it before you hear it. And sometimes you hear it and see it at exactly the same time. There's nothing really quite like it. problem is if you don't see it or hear it the next expression of the lion is a charge which um, you will most certainly hear and see it's been a few years since I've had a lion charge it's not something that we go out to look for but it's definitely something you need to be prepared for when you are doing walking trails because essentially when a lion is charging you they are being as intimidating as they possibly can and uh, it is incredibly intimidating and the objective is to stand very still confidently and uh, not to turn or run away if you did turn or run away that charge would turn into an attack so it's imperative that when you are walking and you encounter lions on foot Sometimes it's not even the lions you have to worry out as much for as it is the people behind you because sometimes the guests behind you want to panic and run and that can be the situation. So you need to be very clear. Do not run. Stand your ground. Stand with me. Hold my shoulder. Hold my shirt. Whatever it might be. That's what's helpful when you've got two guides because the first guide watches the lions. The second guide basically Body coddles the guests to make sure that they don't do anything stupid. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but the worst thing you can do on foot with lions is run away. Worst, absolutely worst thing. A lion can charge you again and again and again, and you can survive that if you stand your ground. But one step or one step turning away and running, there's absolutely no chance. So that's why the training to become a walking trails guide requires enormous amounts of experience and hours on foot with trained guides. I remember my first lion encounter. Um, my mentor was right behind me and he was actually ready to put his hand on my shoulder to make sure I didn't move. He was kind of like, this is how we're gonna train you, trial by fire. Obviously he's there to, to deal with whatever goes wrong, but the whole objective is that I needed to lead the walk a number of walks with people on board and make sure I don't make the wrong moves. And um, after a period of time, lines and foot becomes very, it's a very, not I wouldn't say easy, but it's a very easy thing to remember that your legs just go leaden into the changes and everything slows down. 
and you just know instinctively that you, you can't go anywhere right now. This has to play itself out until those lions leave or you're able to slowly, slowly, slowly back away. Many times you'll find lions from a distance. You'll see them sitting like this, watch them with binoculars and enjoy, and enjoy. Norma, do we ever go tracking? Myself and the cameraman? Well, when we did bushwalks here, we would actually bushwalk with um, a very qualified guide slash tracker. We would have a rifle and uh, we'd go on bushwalks. So we'd carry out exactly tracking missions. We'd find lions, we'd find leopards. Um, Herbert Causa, who used to work here with us, he was exceptional at finding cats. And we used to find every day one, two, sometimes three cat sightings in a morning walk. It was unreal. It's unreal. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that the cameraman is the one who's doing the support. The cameraman is the one who's there filming and we treat the cameraman as a guest. Um, when you learn to do trails, you learn to walk with guests. It's not just me walking with another qualified guide. Although when I was doing my training, we did a lot of that. A lot of three or four or five qualified or becoming qualified guides out on foot, seeing what we can do, seeing what the boundaries are, seeing the reactions animals give you so that when that happens in real life, when you're on your own with a group of paying clients, you know exactly what to do. And nine times out of 10, it's the people management in that group that is so important. So there's a lot of briefings, there's a lot of discussions before we go on a walk. Um, those need to be listened to and understood very, very clearly. The briefing is probably one of the most important elements of a walk, so guests know what to expe expect. And if, for example, we we're tracking lions, I'm gonna have another discussion with you and say this is what could potentially happen. Lay out the whole groundwork, the whole level of what could happen. And then you just watch, you watch everybody's face and you can, you can see who the flighty person is and you just keep an eye on them. BK, you're not flighty, are you? Not like Senzo is flighty. <laughs> so everybody just bear in mind Whatever you do, there's even a book written about it. Whatever you do in the bush, don't run. That's it. Stand by those rules. At one specific guideline, you should be okay. Don't let that prevent you from going on walks. Walks are the best way to experience the wilderness. My absolutely favorite way to experience the wilderness. And lions, for the most part, everybody, are quite afraid of us. And they generally move away. And that's why that intimidation that they try to give you is their last resort of saying, you're too close to me, move away. So when they do do a charge and then back away again, you then back away and give them space until they feel comfortable enough not to feel that they need to intimidate you anymore. But again, body language, very, very important, understanding body language. Calvin, I'm glad I have. It's an incredibly big responsibility being a guide. I mean, a lot of people want to become a guide because they love the animals. Uh, and then you realize very quickly that it's a lot of people management, you know, people expectations, um, people's understanding. What do people want out of the situation? They wanted to see lions on foot. Now that you're in the situation, they really don't want to see lions on foot. How do you manage that? So people management, hosting, discussion, discussing things with guests. You don't just as a guide come out and spend five, six hours with a pride of lion just in your own head and your own thoughts being happy. You're out there interpreting, managing, balancing, building relationships, educating. Did I hear a yala there? Or was that a car making a noise? We might hear it again. Let's reposition, because you've got some flat cats. Will you? Okay. 
Do you want me to just reverse a little bit, Biggs? Sure. You tell me when. Safari. Well, everybody, we are with three lionesses here and look rather full. you might be hearing off to our left hand side is called a, a butka's cacao caco i don't know how to pronounce it properly the afrikaans name is gewone blux blux <laughs> let me try to say that blux slanerki can you hear that clicking sound i'm going to play it in my hat position ourselves again very clicking well welcome back live everybody Boy, we've got a couple of three lion nesses here who are going to show us exactly how camouflaged they can be
perfect little spot for them in the long grass here, close by to a little water point, perfect ambush predator. Kim, I suppose it's just the genetics there, you know, you get some very tawny and then a bit lighter, but generally lions are quite uniform in their tawniness. Sometimes they're dirty, sometimes they're covered in mud and blood. That can also lead to that. But after the rain, most lions look the same. Although we do get the white lion, which is just genetic variation of the normal tawny. And they stand out quite drastically or quite dramatically in the landscape. It's not the most beneficial coloration being white in a landscape that helps to sort of melt the tawny color. So the frog I was talking about before is also used to be called the dainty frog. It was named after the herpetologist Oscar Budger born in, 19, in 1844, died in 1910. He was a German. And the call is a rapid series of high-pitched clicks. Males calling from, males calling from uh, concealed positions amongst the vegetation about water level, the early part of the breeding season. Wide variety of habitats. In the Nama crew, Suckling crew, grassed and thicket, favoring open areas and especially abundant in grass and areas. May be found in forest clearings, but usually absent from dense forests. They estivate in cracks under logs and stones in the dry season. Nathan, I suppose if we could catch one, it would eat one. Let's, uh, let's show a little photo, shall we? I've recently got this uh, frog app on my phone and here he is how oh, pretty lovely orange stripe down the back mm, pictures a bit big for the screen there you can see his feet what a splendid fellow really sticks out there we go the Butkas cacao you can even see the spelling in the top there Caco, caco, butkas, caco. I like cacao, the dark chocolate, the original dark chocolates are, tend to say cacao a lot. Caco, also known as a dainty frog. Thanks, Beaks. I'm making it my mission in the next little while to, to really get into the frogs, I really get into my frogging. joined by another vehicle in the sighting. Uh, they've got as good a view of these lions as we do. I think they're more interested in, in the, the body shape of Wendy and the, the plaques on the outside. It's more, more view than our flat lions right now. But it is what it is. Okay, everyone, so we spend a lot of time with lions, but sometimes it's nice to delve into the depth of their family structure. Most cats are solitary creatures, with lions being the only exception. 
A pride consists of four or five lionesses and their cubs. The whole pride will protect and mentor these youngsters, often carrying them off and saving them from their own curiosity. Bonding between the adults and the cubs often shows these cats' cute and cuddly side. Contrary to what popular culture would have you believe, male lions are not part of the pride and live in coalitions. Young males leave their prides in their adolescence, brothers and cousins roaming the wild in search of a territory of their own. In time, the males settle and look to fortify their feline lineage. Although lazy when it comes to finding their own food, Males have an endearing bond with their cubs. But conflict is never far off as stronger youngsters are always on the horizon, lying in wait to take over territory and claim a pride for themselves. Territorial disputes not only disrupt the peace, often result in casualties, as the new males will attempt to kill the existing cubs to exert their dominance. It is an awful sight but pushes the females of the pride into estrus, allowing the incoming males to state their claim and further their own bloodline. The dynamics displayed by these social cats are intriguing and ever-changing, a contradiction of cuteness and feline ferocity. Well, lions are truly fascinating and uh, you know, we were talking earlier about being on foot with lions and one of the, probably the most important tool for a walking safari guide is a pair of binoculars. Because if BK just pulls back now, just keep your eyes on that lioness. Keep your eyes on her. Keep your eyes on her. Can you see her? Can you see her? Can you see her? Can you still see her? Obviously the others are showing now, but you're walking along and you might just spot something under the tree you're not sure of. Stop. Put your binoculars on it. Oh, lion. Great. You don't need to go closer. The issue we have, or the issue people can experience with lions is if they are walking and they don't see them under trees, they don't see them sheltering in the shade, they're not designed to be seen. They are camouflaged for a reason. And if we can detect them, before we enter any of their different zones, then we can have a wonderful experience. Now, you might ask me, what am I talking about zones? Now, we call the comfort zones. So there's a point, and now these zones are different for every animal, uh, every day, and every experience. Now, you'll have a different comfort zone with animals when you're in a vehicle than when you're on foot, especially if an animal has been habituated. So these lions don't react to us on the car at all. So they've got an incredibly big comfort zone right now. So we can be this close, five meters, four meters, whatever it might be, and they're completely relaxed, completely in their comfort zone. Now, if you are basically out in the wild places and you're walking and you see lion from 80 meters away and they are not even aware of you they don't care you're in the comfort zone now there's a line you will cross which will suddenly change their behavior to one of being alert where they're aware of you they're looking at you but nothing else is happening the next line is the warning line which at that point their body language changes they might make a noise they might react in some way that is warning you after that warning line is the critical zone, at which point you are so close to this animal that they either run away or attack you. Now, let's quickly send you to James. Here we have got a herd of elephants that I think discovered those lions before we did. So as we were pulling back out of camp about 40 minutes ago, I heard elephants going crazy and I thought, ooh, I think they must have found a predator. 
and we had to shoot some other stuff so I wasn't able to follow up. But I think this herd of elephants, which isn't looking particularly relaxed and happy, could have seen those predators. Let's just go around the corner here. Not sure if our signal is going to hold. I hope it does. The signal has been very dodgy today. I'm definitely not going to Yeah. Well, welcome back live, everybody. Sorry about that. Not always easy. Comes with challenges broadcasting from these wild locations. So the reason I'm talking about these comfort zones, they're very important to understand with potentially dangerous animals. Uh, you can see it very easily with animals like Kudu and Impala and that, that there's a They'll watch you, or you'll be driving and there's no reaction, and then they watch you and then they just run away. That's exactly the same story. We just don't really think about those animals because we don't see them as being potentially dangerous. But their behavior is exactly the same. The same as with you and with me. I have some days where I'm much more approachable than other days, um, but it's also if a friend walks into my space, I'm much more accommodating. But if someone who I don't really know or I don't trust or there's something about his vibe I don't like, that warning situation, alert situation, critical zone situation can vary dramatically on any given day. Now, the reason I say this is because lions, elephants and all of that can get very relaxed to vehicles. And if we understand those zones, we know when we can go closer, uh, when we need to move away, when something untoward is happening. Now, the problem comes sometimes when you have animals like this who are completely relaxed, and it has happened in the past, where you think this animal is tame in a way, and you feel like you can just climb out of the car. Now, obviously, us as guides, we do get on and off the car quite regularly, but what could essentially happen is if you're two meters from a lion and you step in to that lion's space, what option does the lion have? You've stepped into the critical zone. You haven't given the comfort zones any thought at all because you've gone straight from comfort to critical. Now that's given that animal very limited opportunity to decide what it wants to do. The beautiful thing about the comfort zone circles is that when they're comfortable, when they're alert, when they're warning, up until that point, the animal's been given so much time and so much ability to decide what it wants to do before it then needs to react in a negative way. But if you don't have those zones and you suddenly, and it's happened, I've had times I've been tracking lions and I suddenly find myself very close to them and they move away. It does happen. Thankfully, they move away. But an animal's reaction in the moment can change from day to day. Victor, I know in the Fagaza level two manual, there's definitely um, comfort zone story there. 
might be able to find it on a, on a good Google search. Yeah. Yeah, you'll be able to find it on a good Google search if you have a look. There's a few PDFs you can download. Animal comfort zones. It's actually a really nice one that I just found here. They call it the, the comfort zone, flight zone, fight zone in this example. But essentially it's the same thing. Alert, warning, critical. Critical is fight, warning is often flight, and comfort is at the outside of the alert zone. starting to rain well it's starting to rain here we're going to probably try to reposition so that the rain doesn't come in from the front and it's a ninja over to Amakala and see what Eric's got we've come back and uh, we've managed to get these red hartebeest that were we had earlier and then they evaded us and went into a bush, disappeared, and now we've come back and we found them in a different spot. Or this could be a different group of males, but I don't think so. I mean, you generally find these four males together They're just going about the daily feeding. It is starting to drizzle again. And um, once again, they don't seem phased by it at all, really. But they are moving uh, towards an area where they are going to be a little bit sheltered from the wind. And uh, there's tall enough trees there for them to be sheltered from the the rain itself. Very impressive animals, the red heart is. They've got quite the headset. Those horns are incredible and very, very thick. Momo, um, I wouldn't say aggressive. I think aggressive isn't... Mm, I wouldn't say aggressive the right word, but, um, you know, out here in the wild, everything is dangerous. It doesn't matter what antelope it is. Uh, antelope can be dangerous and can pose a threat towards us. Um, not that they are going to, um, if startled, animals can be very unpredictable, um, so there can be a level of danger there, but uh, they don't have an aggressive, uh, an aggressive side to them, really. Only, I think males might have an aggressive side towards each other, and uh, that obviously has uh, got to do with the, the hierarchy and the fighting and the uh, uh, competing for, for harems and breeding herds but definitely not towards us. I mean, there was an incident. I've spoken about it before. Um, I actually, I took some people on a, on a safari who were friends with the guy who got hit, or I think it was either his brother or something. I can't remember, but um, a cyclist, I think this was in the Western Cape, a cyclist uh, mid-race, was taken off of his bike by a red hartebeest. Now, these cyclists were going down a single track and uh, there was a, a herd approaching 
obviously they'd been startled by these cyclists um, and they were running from right to left and the cyclists were going down this path and they basically met at the part of that path where those red heart abuse were wanting to cross over the path and obviously running from the cyclist there is a little bit of uh, of scare so they are obviously running with intention and uh, one cyclist connected with a red heart to be and he broke collarbones he broke um elbow not elbows he broke um wrists he broke bro bones in his uh, arms he broke ribs well the red heart to be broke these ribs uh, just from i mean it didn't even it's not like he went straight for the cyclist he just tried to avoid the cyclist and tried to jump over him and didn't quite make it. And instead of jumping over him, he just sort of jumped into him. Um, but, uh, yeah. These boys have very, very thick horns. I mean, wow, wow, we, these are good, good genes. I wonder at some point these guys have got to go and find a harem for them to pass on their incredible genes. No, at least two of these uh, uh, boys here have some of the thickest horns. Not the thickest horns I've ever seen, but I mean, they're tall. They're very long. They're big horns. Um, you know, sometimes the red heart abuse you get very, very thick horns, but not very long horns um, in the males. But then you sometimes get very, very long horns, but not as thick. Now, one of these boys is the best of both worlds here, where he's got some long horns and they are thick. You can only. Imagine the power that he holds. Because they won't be light. Absolutely not, they won't be light. I'd imagine a horn set like that would probably weigh about just short of five kgs, maybe between two and five. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms.
Well, here we have got some impalas. I am sorry to say that our elephants disappeared, but sadly, that is the case. They disappeared along with our signal. So now we have slowly returned back towards camp, where we will hopefully find something of interest at the breakfast table. The drizzle is setting in, so it's probably quite a good thing that we're heading towards the camp. Our final offering for the day being these imbalas. Okay, I think we're probably just going to drift slowly forward because these things are becoming hidden. Exciting times here in parlors. Welcome back to those of you who've just rejoined us. We find ourselves on the clearings just outside our camp. The impalas that we were looking at have disappeared and uh, we see the Vorv turning for camp. He has had a wet day, as has BK. <laughs> It's been a trying morning from a signal point of view, but we've had really magnificent animals, haven't we? It's been great on the, um, the animal front. Lions, wild hounds, and elephants. Word on the blower is that Clalamba the leopardess, for whom we seek on an almost continuous basis, is east of us on a reserve called Torchwood. So I don't think we're going to see her today unless she decides to come across here. Oh, Gary. Well, we have to do that. We don't have a choice, Gary, and it's always a pleasure, unless the wind is particularly unpleasant and the rain is falling very hard. But it wasn't doing either of those things today. So, Gary, it's our absolute pleasure, especially when we get to spend time with hounds and kitties. Our impala are now in the middle of the clearing. They're a little herd of bachelors. They're a little bit like, um, I mean, those of you who are, are, are men of a certain age will understand this, but you know when you're a young man and you're just coming into adolescence, it's an incredibly awkward time and you go to some kind of social event and you hang around in a group of equally awkward, spotty-faced youths hoping to be noticed and being studiously ignored by all and sundry uh, because, I don't know, there's just something unattractive about that stage of male mammalian life. And those two, those five or six impala are in exactly that stage. They are spotty-faced youths seeking some sort of social place in the world and they'll find it but it's a, it's a difficult time, so I felt sorry for them. They're around about two years old, which is just getting into their kind of adolescence. Well, we do our best, Jive Bunny. You say Wild Earth helps many of you with your life issues. Well, I, I certainly, we don't aim to be psychologists. We don't proclaim to be psychologists. We know nothing about psychology and any healing effect that we have is purely because of the nature that surrounds us and that's what nature does nature heals it's an ancient part of each and every one of us and sadly to most human beings it is a whispered memory somewhere deep in the recesses of our evolutionary past let me see if i can say that again Nature is but a whispered memory 
somewhere deep in the recesses of our evolutionary past. Quite like that. And I might try and remember it for a later time as well. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your questions and your comments and mostly for your patience. In fact, mostly for your attention. We will see you later this afternoon at Hoppers 3. Bye-bye.